pretty awesome, eh? Can I like use that illustration? Oh man. Um, te whare etu nei uh, tēnā koe. I ngā maunga, ngā awa, um, ngā whenua, te moana i takatō nei tēnā koutou katoa. Tua roa ki ngā mate, haere, haere, haere atu. Ngā mahi ki te iwi uh, e tō nei nga te whatoa o rākei tēnā koutou. Kia tātou e tō nei, kia ora. Nō reira e hoa mā, um, me motu i kō nei. So ko Roy Ping toki ingoa, um, ko Manju Raua, ko Han oki iwi, um, ko Critical Takamahi, tēnā koutou katoa. So I'm one of the co-founders at Critical, um, and we're a clean tech startup on a mission to transform plastic waste into beautiful and durable and endlessly recyclable materials for building fit outs and products. Um, I actually want to start the talk today with a story. It is a story that have challenged me over the years, like a good friend. It is a story that was told to me by the very first Māori judge that, uh, that was appointed in the Supreme Court, Justice Joe Williams. Um, and I want to retell his version, and I hope I don't stuff it up. So I've got notes. So this is a story about an ancestor of Aotearoa. I'll just stand over here, eh? Um, called Kupe, who decided to migrate south with, I'm damn sure, the consent of his wife, Kura Marotini. Um, there have been some problems in Hoiki, their home island, and it was time to leave. Kupe and Kura Marotini knew that there was land to be found in the south. They knew it was there because every year in about September, this beautiful bird here, called the, the Pipifaroroa, or the shining cockatoo, would leave Hoiki and come back in six months' time. And they knew that it had to be land there because it didn't have web feet. If you find yourself in the Waitakere Ranges in, in September, you can actually hear it today. And so about a month later in October, Kupe and his wife left on a double haul waka with their son, two nieces, and the wider Fano from their village, making up about 25. The signs that they deployed to make that unbelievable journey of 3,000 odd miles was the, some of the best cutting edge science deployed at the time. Anywhere on the planet, actually. What they did was the opposite of what James Cook did. What James Cook did was to abstract himself from the environment, draw a picture of what he saw in the hopes of helping to navigate him here. And it worked. But what Coupe did was to bury himself in the environment to know the patterns of the albatrosses and what distances they would travel from land, to know what cloud formations indicated land and what didn't, and to know when the swell would bend to indicate land. And about a month later, all 25 of them were out there in the middle of the ocean on their waka. Coupe was probably asleep because he was the navigator, and as the navigator, you will be awake all night reading the stars. And Kura Marutini, Coupe's wife, uttered these once famous words, Hey ao, hey ao, hey ao te roa. Man, it gives me the shivers eh, even to say that. Like, a cloud, a cloud, a long white cloud. Now the science that these people deployed was such that they understood convection clouds um, built up over significant bodies of land. And so the darker the bottom of the cloud, the more verdant the land. And so the story goes, hey ao, hey ao, hey ao te roa. But I'm pretty sure what she said was, Coupe, holy shit, <laughs> get your ass out of bed. Because this was the biggest conviction cloud that any Polynesian or Māori have ever seen. And so it was that made the greatest journey of our species, according to the great anthropologist Jared Diamond. It was the great feat of the human race. It was a miracle, but not if you were a coupe, because your science was that good. And the amazing thing is that Kupe's descendants became Māori on that whenua. They built a new language, a new culture, a new way of thinking in this cold but unbelievably plentiful land. These Māori were so happy that they bloody forgot how to get back home. And it's what 800 years, happened 800 years later that I wanted to talk about too. A modern Hawaiian in the 1970s called Nainoa Thompson decided that he wanted to relearn Kupe's skill. So he founded a Micronesian man called Mo to explain to him how his ancestors navigated the entire Pacific with no instruments. Mo then taught him for two years. At the end of their time, when Nainua and a crew that he had built was going to make this unbelievable journey from Hawaii to Tahiti Nui, 
and I knew it was going to be the navigator, and I knew it was going to be Coupe, Mo, this tiny Micronesian man with pretty bad English, took him to the island of Oahu, to a place overlooking the horizon, and asked, Nainoa, recite to me the star chart from here to Tahiti. So Nainoa does it, and Mo says, do it again. And Nainoa does it again. At this point, Nainoa started to get a bit worried. Do it again, Mo said. And he did it another four times. And Mo said to him, can you see the island? Nainoa said that he knew that this was a pivot point. However he answered this question, was going to decide whether they were going to Tahiti, whether Mo went home and that it was all over. So he said he kind of freaked out and lost courage and said to Mo, I, I, I don't understand what you're asking of me. So Mo walked away. Next day, back in the same place. Same deal, like Karate Kid. Wax on, wax off. <laughs> three days later, they went, they, they, for three days they went through this and I knew I hadn't figured out what the heck was going on. He knew this was important but he had a crisis of confidence. The fourth day, they get through the fifth recitation of the star chart, which each recitation takes about 20 minutes. Nainoa said, Nainoa said, he closed his eyes and he imagined the island of Tahiti Nui in his head. And he finally understood what this old fella was on about. And he said, yes, Mo, yes, I see the island now. And Mo said to him, you must keep that island in your mind. There'll be heavy seas, dark nights, and sometimes no wind at all. And your crew will become restless, worried and anxious. If you keep that island in your mind, in those times you'll be safe. But if you lose it, and because you're the navigator, you will die and your crew will die with you. Now Noah said to her that this experience wasn't about navigation at all but it was a fundamental truth about leadership, which is you have to know where you're taking your waka. And if you don't know that, if you mistake your job for negotiating with the squalls or the sudden gusts of wind, school by school, you will die. You have to have a vision in your head and back it up with preparation and courage. So Kupe and Ainoa both arrived at their destination they were pleased, but they weren't surprised. And we, when we navigate with hard work, vision and courage, we will be pleased, but we will not be surprised. I heard this story in 2017 um, at the end of Leadership New Zealand. And by the end, I was just weeping in the crowd, trying to just hide my tears. And um, not, yeah, so like, we were sitting in this crowd, but I was trying so hard to hold this because it, it hit me, it just it hit me really close to home. Thinking about today, we live in the midst of a climate crisis, a disrupted economy caused by a pandemic and war. Our future has never been this uncertain, but the story about how our, about how our Polynesian and Maori ancestors crossing the vast ocean from Hawaii to Aotearoa over 800 years ago, tell us that we've been here before. I believe now is the time for us to collectively imagine and hold on to a brave new vision of the future, a new island per se, and back ourselves with preparation and hard work. And so in that spirit, I'd like to share with you, or pitch you, Critical's vision and plan for the future. We are currently raising a seed investment round and are looking for everyday investors to jump on our waka by joining our crowd equity campaign. I bet you weren't expecting that, that I was going to pitch you. <laughs> it's too late now. I'm going to get Ryan to lock the doors. And we've got seven hours, so let's get started. As a Māori company, we exist to uplift the Modi of Taiao. Our health and well-being is inextricably tied to the well-being of our natural world. And therefore, when the Wai order, the well-being, of how land and rivers and oceans are affected, it affects us all. And you don't need to be Māori to feel this yourselves. We started critical because we want to be good tipunga, or ancestors, so that our generation or the generations beyond us can thrive not for 10 or 100, but for thousands of years to come. I want to share with you another story. This one is pretty crack up though. In 1894, 
The Times once predicted that in 50 years, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of manure. The problem was horse waste. The International Urban Planning Commission at the time couldn't find a solution and it seemed that urban civilization was doomed. I mean, it's funny now, <laughs> but like in 1894, like, like in the 1500s, if you had diarrhea, it's going, oh, better get my affairs in order. Um, today, the world produces nearly a thousand times in plastics each year and only 9% is recycled. Every piece of plastics ever created still exists today. Our plastics problem kind of feels like we're drowning in horse shit, doesn't it? In New Zealand, businesses are responsible for over about 83% of all plastics to landfill. And construction is the single biggest culprit. But we as customers, investors and employees are putting pressure on those big brands and the businesses to do better. Which is why they have all made public plastic zero, climate neutral or waste zero waste commitments by ambitious targets, 2035 or 2050. However, the product and technology to deliver it doesn't yet exist. You see where I'm going, guys. Critical has built the technology platform to transform almost all 24 types of plastics into our first product, the Critical Clean Zone. Our range of beautiful, durable, and endlessly recyclable panels for building fit-outs and beautiful products. It is the eco-disruptor to the near trillion dollar global industry for timber and fiberboard. There are over 24 plastic types or plastic waste, types of plastic waste, and most countries can recycle only about four, we believe four to six types. So we spent four years bootstrapping the development of our hardware and novel IP from a technology lab we took over and adapted in an intermediate school. We have since raised a half a mil pre-seed, launched our pilot plant by the airport in Tamaki in Monaco, survived a freaking tornado last year, and relaunched our ready-to-scale solution. Our Unibond technology takes contaminated plastics there is no solution for and turn them into panels that can take a beating while offsetting approximately 1.4 tonnes of carbon for every tonne of plastics recycled. We can then endlessly customise the material look and feel to create unique brand stories and to ensure our clean stone never go out of fashion. And at the end of life, we buy back our materials, our panels, and recycle them into new clean stone in a, um, in a fully circular loop. And our plan is to scale our products globally by putting our technology, the critical micro factory, into every city in the world. So I want to give you a few examples. An example is Kōkaku in Commercial Bay, using sort of the panels, our clean stone panels, to sort of clad and fit out the offices, um, sorry, their, their, their cafe. And the story was that they were taking 8,000 bottles collected and used and turn them into panels to then fit out a cafe, cafe waste into a cafe beautiful experience, beautiful cafe experience. Another cool example, or at least I think it's pretty cool, um, there's one image that isn't quite showing up, that's all right, is um, we took 50,000 uh, Torpedo 7 plastic bags that were phased out, I think in 2019, and we turned them into our clean stone panel that Torpedo 7 um, then used to sort of fit out the Torpedo 7 new market store. So you'll see the panels made out of their waste as countertops, retail fixtures, bathroom doors, div dividers, brands across their store sort of pepper potted everywhere. And this is the cool example that um, uh, our mate Rebecca over here, where our panels were used as part of the Motat exhibition. I think Jess Gomez designed, um, designed it, um, yeah, using our Piha panel, which is made from a construction waste and then created this really beautiful insulation um, out of the post-consumer mix. So yeah, clean stone panels that look like waves. So go check it out, it's a, it's a pretty cool place. I wish I knew about that there was a um, giveaway about free family passes. I would have <laughs> saved to go like this week. So um, <laughs> can we get reimbursed now? <laughs> um, I, I was cheeky, I was like, hey, um, hey, um, hey, hey, uh, hey, hey, just, just real quick. Um, do I get to go in for free if like, our stuff is in there? <laughs> And the guy was like, I put him on the spot, eh? And he got real awkward, and I was like, I'm just joking. I wasn't joking. It's, it's fucking guarded, eh? Um, another good example is um, Mangirewa High School, using our clean stones to reclad their reception space. And so we designed kind of this, um, the school have a pepeha. Uh, so Mangirewa High School sits between two maunga and the awa. 
and, 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 and their waka as well, which is meant to be the counter. And so that, that was designed and then used to sort of tell that story. The, um, the green is actually made out of, our ponamu mix is made out of fishnets um, that turn into a greenstone panel. The black and white alpiha mix is from, made from a construction tube of mixed plastics um, bonded together. The blue is actually made from healthcare, like off-cut products um, that are used for respiratory equipment and stuff. So plastic wastes offer a wide range of perks, and in clean stone form, we're flipping that script by turning an environmental problem into product advantages. If we factor in the total cost of ownership, namely its sort of near indestructibility, zero water reactivity, and zero into low maintenance and the ease of install, um, and the ability to last a lifetime, compared to even MDF, our clean stone is more affordable at year eight, even at the premium prices if you're buying them one at a time right now. So here we're going to get to some really nitty gritty investment stuff. You guys, you guys keen? Like we can talk some numbers? Yeah? <laughs> so we've created two investment scenarios, a minimum and a maximum. Hitting our minimum will enable us to increase production capacity, by using our current gene technology with step changes and process improvements. We will obtain key certifications rubber stamps to enable our B2C customers to specify our panels more broadly in the fit out industry and hire key development managers to grow our B2C and B2B pipelines. So, so B2C just means like we're selling directly to customers and everyday users. B2B means that we're selling to a business like the warehouse group who then like, um, they're like one big customer but they've got a lot of spaces. Um, we will increase the capacity um, of processing up to about 280 tonnes per year diverted from landfill and reach healthier margins and self-fund the next-gen technology development ourselves. We get all that? Yeah? Clear as, clear as, clear as day? Um, to enact our plan to put critical microfactories into every city in the world, we need to execute on our next-generation development plan. Hitting our maximum target of 2 mil would enable us um, to set aside a dedicated R&D team who will then get us to the next gen faster, which means we can scale faster. This looks like increasing our production and capacity by up to eight times, with better margins through leap change developments and reduced labour spent in production. This production efficiency will also enable us to lower the, the price of our products, also making it more accessible to more people. Um, we estimate if we raise this and we raise our maximum, we estimate getting to our Series A raise, which is another way of just saying um, it's like a bigger investment scale-up round, looking at maybe 10 to 20 mil, we should be able to get there in about 30 months and start ready to franchise and put that with other city and other partners. And we'll probably start in Aussie and New Zealand at the same time. Some examples of um, partners that we're currently working with. So the, the play for us have been two ways. One is to work with creatives like yourselves, um, where you'll specify and use the panels for projects. But the bigger play that we also have, well the other play, not the bigger play, is that we're partnering with big corporates like the Warehouse Group, KFC, McDonald's, um, where effectively they will be, they'll send us their plastics that is hard to recycle, we turn them into a clean stone, and then they buy back what they send us. So if they send us 10 tonnes of plastics, we turn that into 10 tonnes of panels that they then buy back to use across their stores. And that, so the way the way that we believe this will help us scale fast is to go, hey, um, hey, McDonald's, hey, real quick, we've done, what, we've done this for you guys by turning your waste into panels for all of your restaurants in, in Aotearoa. It doesn't take that much of a stretch of imagination to partner with you and start doing other countries like Aussie and Asia Pacific and the States. And so we think these partners, the B2B partners, can be one of the key partners that we can lean alongside us to scale and use Aotearoa as the testing ground or the pilot stage ground. We found a critical with the goal of building an enduring company that exists to care for people and our land. I'm actually an architect by training, a technology tinkerer, and obsess over products and customers. I help lead big corporates and commercial brands and government organizations to innovate new products and services through human-centered design at EY. Adam is, not, is of um, Ngāti Raukawa and Ngāti Kahununu Whakapapa. For 17 years, he's led large and startup brands to success and he was the former CFO at Saatchi & Saatchi. Hannah, our CTO, is driven to develop and scale green technology solutions. Her decades-long engineering experience spanned from innovating in large companies like Boeing, Yamaha, Fisher & Paykel, um, and, he, and she led technical startups to innovate new products in ODOX, Akuro, 
and her own consultancy, uh, Popcorn. So for us, critical is more than our work, it's kind of our life's work. Um, if we weren't solving this problem within critical, we'll probably be looking at solving this problem in different capacities. This is also, by the way, when you're pitching to investors, like, invest in us, back us as people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so our plan is that over the coming months, our next steps are to close out funding, secure nationwide contracts to hit our sales targets, ramp up production and capability to deliver on contracts, and build our next-gen critical microfactory technology to, um, ahead of our scale-up raise in Series A to enable us to expand to key cities. Yeah, and we're actually planning a crowd equity campaign alongside um, a, a, a wholesale investor round, which is the, the impact investors um, that we have. So yeah, we're looking for everyday people who care about um, the environment, who care about beautiful products that solve a really big problem, to join us as shareholders. Over the years, um, we've had, I guess, everyday people kind of hit me up and go, hey, Rory, um, you know, I don't have a lot of money. I've got a hundred bucks to a thousand to a thousand dollars. I believe in what you guys are doing. I care about it. Um, how do I get in and, and join what you guys are doing? So we created the crowd equity round for that very sort of audience to make it more accessible. Now, it, it only took 12 years, the length of an investment cycle, to solve the great horse manure crisis of 1894. <laughs> We are looking for everyday investors who care about the environment and great products to join our seed investment round before this shit hits the fan. No reira e hoa ma, no mai, haere mai. Whakaikia ki te waka e tere ake nei. Kia ora. <laughs>